somewhere along the way. But we can start. Um, the last time we left off at the seven step program. So I will just go through that very quickly. And if you have any questions, we can go through that. And the seven we can't see anything right step now. Step program, yes, it's coming, it's coming. It's showing now, yes. Okay. Yes, it does. Okay, so the seven step program that's all on the website, and the first step is establishing natural, effortless diaphragmatic breathing, absolute priority. Absolute basic necessity and we cannot progress really without this and I mentioned that if you have not established this it's best not to do uh, any further Practices breathing practices or pranayama practices. It's best that one establishes diaphragmatic breathing after which you can start working with even or equal breath. In your practice, working on silent breathing without sound. When you do breathing practices, establish a very smooth, fine breath without any jerks. Towards the end of the program, you would find yourself also be able to eliminate extended pauses there's always a slight pause between inhalation and exhalation, quite unconscious. Very often the pauses are quite extended depending on how stressed the person is. The more stressed the people are, the longer these pauses are, they're almost gasping sometimes. We may have met or seen people who tend to sometimes talk, speak so fast that they almost need to gasp for breath between. You know, they are not able to breathe in a natural way. They have very long extended pauses. This is extremely unhealthy and it's important to remove these extended pauses and establish a very fine breath. Sixth would be to establish an elongated breath. Now I'm talking about during practice. It doesn't mean that you have to have an elongated breath all the time. You don't walk around with 30 seconds in and 30 seconds out. That might expand as well, but your natural breath would remain somewhere around 4 or 5. But during your practice, you extend your breath, you elongate your breath, eventually working your way up to something like 30 seconds in and 30 seconds out. And finally, when we have done all this, you're beginning to get a feel of the very, very fine breath. That very fine breath will lead you to prana. It's a very beautiful story that goes with it. There was a king who had a very clever Prime Minister. But unfortunately, this Prime Minister invited the wrath of the king. The king got very angry and sentenced him and had him imprisoned in a tower. So he was very high up and in this tower, locked away, and he, his wife came to visit and he had a plan to escape. He told his wife um, to organize a, a beetle, some honey, and ropes of varying thickness, and finally some silk thread. So she found this all very strange, strange requests, but she did what she was told to. So one night she stood below his window, below the tower, called him and he said okay put some honey on the antenna of the beetle and 
tie a very fine silk thread to the leg of the beetle. So the beetle was put then on the wall and smelling the honey on its own antenna kept going upwards until he reached the window and he took that fine breath, sorry, the fine <laughs> thread and then the thread was long enough he asked his wife to tie a thicker, slightly thicker thread at the bottom at the end of the silk thread. He pulled up that thin rope. Now he had a slightly thicker rope in his hand and he told his wife to tie a, a thick rope to the end of this thinner rope and she did that and he pulled up this thick rope and he tied the big rope of course um, to the bars of uh, the window or, or wherever he tied it and he was able to escape, climb down the thick rope. The story indicates that we need to have this thick thin and this very fine, subtle silk, silk thread and one leads to the other, leads to the finest. So that's how we go in our breathing from the gross to the subtle, to the subtle most. And so here we establish through our breath certain smoothness, remove the jerks, remove the noises, until it gets finer and finer. And when you have reached a certain point, you're beginning, be just beginning to understand prana itself. You're getting a feel for it. That does not mean you have mastery over prana or you have experienced, had a direct experience of prana, but you're beginning to get that experience. Okay, are we fine till here? Are there any questions? Okay, so I'll just go ahead. This session we start with Rechak, also known as two to one breathing. As usual, we begin with the basics. The basic is first checking how much you are breathing in your normal breath your absolute natural breath. You're making no effort. Breathe in naturally, test how long you're breathing in, how long you're breathing out. For example, you may have a person breathing in four seconds, breathing out three seconds. What do you take? You take three seconds then as the base. The breath may be even as short as three seconds in and two seconds out. Then you take the lower count. So, we would take two seconds in and two seconds out for equal breathing. But for Rechak, you would take four to two. So, you would test this by putting your finger in front of your nostrils and then begin at that point of time, having started with the lower count. In order to establish your base, you can check your breath at various times of the day. You may notice that there may be differences in counts depending on the time of the day, how tired you are, your emotional state. Except the most, you know, the common count which is your base that you start with. So if we assume that your natural count is two seconds in and three seconds out, you would start with two seconds. You would breathe out four seconds and breathe in two seconds. That would be the first breath. The sitting postures we did in an earlier session. And so you could sit in Maitriyasan, Sukhasan, Svastikasan or Siddhasan. Okay. Um, there's an android attendee who is still not muted himself or herself. I'll just click mute this person. If possible, I would request you to put your names there. There are three android attendees. It would be nice to have 
your names. Okay, so you take two seconds and you would start with four seconds breathing out and four seconds breathing in. And this is one breath. Do this ten times, that's one round. At the end of the round, you take a little bit of time to re-establish your normal breath, your normal breathing pattern. Initially, this doesn't make any sense because you wonder why you have to wait here for after 10 rounds. But when this keeps increasing over time, you might have something like 30 seconds out and 15 seconds in. Then it would be good to have a pause, a break between rounds. How long should the break be? As I said, the break should be as long as you are comfortable and you are breathing normally again. That you are not out of breath, that you are not straining yourself. <clears throat> You can do that after a while. You don't need to keep counting. You can also do this without counting. And you can do the same without counting so that you can establish silent, breathe, silent breathing without noise. You can establish that smooth breathing without jerks. And you can eliminate the extended pause. When you have counting numbers just by the fact that you have numbers tends to create jerks you know numbers are static you go one two three so very naturally somehow your breath develops jerks in it so you can eliminate these jerks or have a smoother breath if you don't count but you use another way, another method to have a measure of time. So you can do this in sitting position. And if you do this in sitting position, the way you would get an idea of the count would be by breathing in from the crown of the head. Sorry, breathing out from the crown of the head to the base of the spine and breathing in from the heart chakra to the crown of the head. It's approximately half then. We can give up counting if you're comfortable giving up counting then go ahead and give up counting because as we say in our tradition we are not accountants. Accountants count. We don't need to count. It is a good measure of time initially, but it has its limitations. And the limitations are, one, of course, that the counting creates a bit of jerks. Two, the counting disturbs the mind because you're paying attention to the counting sometimes more than to the breath itself. The idea is, to forget the counting and be entirely with the breath. And that's only possible when you stop counting. And of course, the third reason is that you are more internalized. If you have an external counting aid, for example, a clock or a watch, and you're using, or an app, people love to use apps these days. They have all sorts of meditation apps. These are... A crutch they take us out of meditation they take us out of the internalization process they pull you completely out to the body and to the external level so that doesn't help very much so there's a question from Shivu measure of time needs to be 100% accurate or is it okay no it doesn't need to be 100% accurate you're not an accountant that's exactly what I said it's just to give you an idea. It's an approximate idea. It does not matter. If you 
are interested in elongating your breath, then I would suggest the best way to do it is first establish all these points. Silent breathing, smooth breathing, eliminate extended pause, elongate your breath and then drop the numbers. And so you can drop the numbers at a slightly higher count. When you're already at 20, 10 or, you know, 24, 12, something like that. Okay? Uh, Aranka, heartbeat is also there. Hmm. Well, if you are entirely with your breath, you will not hear your heartbeat. You will forget about it. Okay. Mm-hmm. But, but sometimes I, I mean, it's, it's actually disturbing. Yeah, yeah. So I use, yeah, I use it as a counting. Yeah. Because it's also like a second or so. Mm-hmm. But I found it also disturbing. Mm. Indeed, it is disturbing. I suggest you do not use heartbeats to count. Um, okay. It's, uh, you, you're then diverting your mind away from the breath to the heartbeats and in a sense in terms of space you're then moving from your nostril to the heart center right that's right yeah so don't go into heartbeats you just learn to ignore them it's like when you are i don't know when you're gardening for example (laughs) i think you're gardening (laughs) um (laughs) yes and um and I don't know, uh, somebody calls you and you're so busy in gardening, it may happen that you don't even hear the person, right? I mean, that could happen. Yeah. 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 So it's a similar process of paying attention, of, of being immersed. It's like when you're immersed in a, a good book, you know, a very exciting novel or, um, you know, thriller, you don't hear anybody speaking to you. Yes. Right, And so it's a similar process that you stay with the breath. At some point of time, you will leave behind all these other sounds. You will not hear your heartbeats anymore. You will not hear anything external in any case. So, but... Okay. okay. But in a way, I found it also nice because it was a natural counting machine. (laughs) So... Yeah. uh, (laughs) Yeah. I didn't have to count or whatever. It was just there. So it's, yeah, it, it will take some effort to let that go because it becomes a bit of a habit. <laughs> yes, exactly. You see, that's exactly what happens. Now, over yeah. time, you have created the habit of using a heartbeat for counting. And yeah. <laughs> that habit will take some time for you to unlearn. If you don't let go of that, you will be stuck at the body level. Do you understand Yes. You will not only be stuck at the level of the body, you will also be at a different space. You will not be at the breath. And the breath is the bridge to the mind. Yes. So now you have done completely different practice. (laughs) You are in a different (laughs) space as well as you have... Uh, remain at the level of the body. You have not moved to the next level of breath. And the breath, which then leads us to the mind. So you have stayed, you will stay at the body level. If you continue that, you will stay with the body. And I don't think that that's what you want to do. No, no. You want to... Oh, thank you. Yes, you want to let go of that and move to the next subtler level, right? You want to go from the rope to the the thinner rope and then move to the silk thread you know, get it finer and finer. So you want to yeah. move inwards. Good, but that was a, a, a good um, uh, question or example because there are a lot of people who do such things and um, that's good that we clarified that. Yeah, thank you. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. So another way of doing the counting or other measure of time without numbers is to do it in the supine position, lying down. And you can do the breathing practice by breathing out from the crown of the head to the tip of the toes. And then breathe in from 
the base of the spine to the crown of the head. This practice I would only recommend to do for more advanced students. For those students who have been doing this for long enough that are not going to fall asleep or do it at a time you will definitely not fall asleep. Do not do this late in the evening or at night because you're going to fall asleep. And just like we mentioned with Aranka, where a habit is formed, you will end up forming a habit here of falling asleep. So uh, we have seen cases where people are using such practices to fall asleep. And they say, oh, wonderful, I don't have any sleep problems. Um, I just do this practice and I fall asleep. Well, that's true. You may not have any sleep, sleep problems after that. You may not have any issues falling asleep. But you're definitely not going to be doing this practice then. You will have created a habit of using the practice to fall asleep. These practices are meant to make you alert, not to help you fall asleep. Okay? So, practices in lying down position only to be done at times when you are not going to fall asleep or you are an advanced practitioner, you've been doing this for really, I mean a long time, I mean years. And you're confident enough that you're not going to sleep and that it helps you keep awake. So how do we elongate the breath? We said, yes, you can continue to count keep elongating the breath and maybe at some point of time you want to let go the counting then you can let go the counting but as long as you are using the counting you can use this kind of program for yourself which is merely a suggestion it's not a rule it just gives you an idea how to do this so the first four weeks you can establish the practice of Rechak, taking the minimum count of two, inhaling, then you would take four to exhale. The next two weeks, you do six to three. The following two weeks, eight to four, and so on and so forth, until you come to week 29-30. And you would be by then inhaling 15 in and exhaling 30 out. This is a good um, breath. That would be a very good um, practice if you are able to do this over 30 weeks. And um, that's seven to eight months. It means you would not exceed your capacity. You would be very gentle. These kind of practices are quite intense on the lungs. If you force yourself, you can damage the very fine tissues in the lungs. Irreparable damage. No doctor will be able to help you. Modern science will not be able to help you. So it is important that you're very gentle with this and do not exceed your capacity. If you are able to do this, wonderful. This will be very useful practice to remove toxins, to help you relax. Any questions so far on this? I've got a question. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, you, you mentioned that it's possible to cause damage to the finer tissues in the lungs. Uh, uh, would that affect us physically or in our meditation? Both. Both. It will. You, you damage your lungs permanently. You know, uh, this is uh, this can have uh, 
a terrible impact on your health. It's equivalent to saying, uh, you know, you're, you're smoking a couple of packets of cigarettes every day. That's what happens if you do that. You damage your lungs. So is it more, more dangerous, would you say, than um, um, doing sports and trying a bit harder than you should whilst you're doing some sport activity? Sports is different, but mostly what happens in sports is the body tends to start using diaphragmatic breathing, chest breathing, thoracic breathing, and clavicular breathing. When a person has a very high need for oxygen, you know, when you're running or doing sports, you have a higher need for oxygen. And so the body goes into the mode of breathing all three levels. We did this, in, I think, in the very first session, that we have yeah. three basic kinds of breathing. And day-to-day -day life, the most efficient way of breathing is using the diaphragm. But when we are under stress, we have a greater need for oxygen, like when we're running. Stress doesn't mean uh, what modern idea of stress. Stress means when uh, you are in the fight or flee mode, which could be also in sports. It's a, bit, it is a kind of a stress. So whatever the situation may be, whether it's sports or whether you really need to run away from, I don't know, may run for a bus or a train, for example. You know, you need to cut, catch a bus or a train and you run for it. You will find yourself a bit out of breath. If you study your breathing after that, you will find your heaving, you know, your chest. Because for, this, for that additional burst of energy and oxygen, you start using also your chest. When you're chronically in these situations, you also start using the clavicular muscles. And this can cause a great deal of disturbance in the pranic vehicles, you know, mentally as well, physically as well. So in sports, you, use, you would use chest breathing as well to compensate. It would not damage your lungs. That's a completely different, uh, you know, this is different because here you're trying to inhale more, you're still using your diaphragm, and you need this, these fine um, tissues in the lungs for that as well, which could possibly be damaged. Okay, but, but it's, yeah. not, it's not like you're going to damage your lungs, don't panic. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> it makes sense. So, yeah. so basically we're unconsciously adapting whilst doing sports, whereas yes. uh, when we're practicing, we're actually kind of uh, forcing our breathing to do something. Yes, that's the difference. Yeah. We, uh, that's a very important aspect of breathing that we also mentioned in the very first session, I think, in first or second, that... Breathing is one of those few uh, systems in the body that is both voluntary as well as involuntary. So your blood circulation, your digestive system, all these are involuntary. You cannot control them. You know, blood will circulate. It's going to circulate whatever you do. You can will yourself not to circulate the blood, but it's going to circulate. So you cannot change that. But the breath... If you don't do anything about it, it's involuntary. It still continues right now as we are speaking. You're breathing in, breathing out. And when you do sports, it will adjust naturally part of the involuntary system. But here, in a breathing practice, you're shifting from that involuntary mode to a voluntary mode. And that's why you need to be even more careful that you don't exceed your capacity. And the reason I stress this again and again, because this is happening all the time. There are a lot of modern yoga studios where people do some teacher's training program, 200 hours or something. This is really not enough. And start teaching something they have not practiced themselves. Or they're forcing themselves to do things that they are just reading out of books without any kind of guidance. <clears throat> in the tradition, the teachers that we are talking about, you know, what 
or have grown up with. <laughs> we are talking about having <clears throat> been a student in inverted commas for 15 years, not 200 hours. You know, if you calculate the time, if, if it's not a full-time thing and it's just part-time, you come up to over 10,000 hours. And so that's a different level of experience and understanding. But if you don't know these things and then you experiment, you damage your own lungs, but you also end up damaging other people's lungs. That's not right. And that's why I keep saying, don't take these practices lightly. I have seen so many people being ambitious about this. It's not about who can count more, you know, who, if you breathe in 30 seconds in and out, you know, it doesn't make you a yogi or, or, an, uh, or even an advanced person in any way. Would that also have an impact then on the mental level, not just on the physical level, oh, uh, on the mental level? Definitely, do definitely, these things of course. You see, when we talk about pranic vehicles being disturbed, what does that mean? Pranic vehicles being disturbed means the energy system of the entire body is damaged. And the mind is part of this interwoven complex system. We are one being. We are not body and mind are not separate, you know. They're woven together. And the pranic vehicle being damaged simply means that you could end up suffering from, I think I've made a little list here of things and I was being, actually not wanting to put panic, uh, you know, create panic here, but things like headache, erratic mood changes, even depression, a tendency to coughs and colds and congestion, tiredness rather than feeling um, energetic and alert, you know, or dizziness and prolonged incorrect pranayam techniques can lead to serious permanent disturbance and imbalance in the nervous system. What is the nervous system? I mean, it's, an, it's an extension of the, the brain and of the, and of the mind. So, again, but I don't want anybody to panic. <laughs> Just saying that caution is advised and... Uh, as I said this, if, if you use your common sense and don't start getting too ambitious or pushing yourself beyond your limit, you will be fine. All right. So shall we continue to the next... Uh, thing, yes, the next thing after this. Yes, um, I wanted to mention that Rechak, for example, two to one breathing is a wonderful release of toxins. It removes all the carbon dioxide from the lungs, even the very, very fine bronchi system. It removes the oxygen from there. It oxygenates the entire brain, entire blood circulation system. And um, at, a, at a very deep level, the whole practice of exhalation itself is very relaxing. You may have experienced this and you have noticed this definitely when, when you are under a little bit of stress, you have a deadline, you know. When it's done, you go, you know, you breathe out like a sigh of relief. What is that? Exhalation. Exhalation releases tension. Exhalation is a form of deep relaxation. So do not turn this practice of two to one breathing into a stress by pushing yourself beyond your means, by sitting in an uncomfortable posture where you are rigid, where your muscles are rigid, your posture should be relaxed. Whatever posture you're sitting in should be relaxed. So if you're sitting in um, Sukhasan or in the auspicious pose, Svastikasan, you should be relaxed. 
Any kind of stress or tension is counterproductive. At all points of time, that's one sort of benchmark. Always be relaxed. This is not a competition. We even say that pranayama actually is a form of, really a form of relaxation, these breathing exercises. They prepare us for the advanced pranayama that we have often talked about. They are not themselves really pranayama. Pranayama is that which is done mentally. These are breathing practices. They purify the body, they remove the toxins, they relax the body, they make the breath finer and smoother and gentler, and they prepare you for deeper pranayama. So we can go to the next practice here. The next uh, breathing practice is Dirk Svasam. That's the complete breath. And some of you may know this practice. In the complete breath, the basic idea is to use diaphragm and chest breathing as well as clavicular, all the three. That's called the complete breath. So you breathe in, or so, sorry, we always start with exhalation, so you breathe out completely, and then you breathe in using all three. Diaphragm, chest, and clavicular. Now, a very easy way of understanding this is, think of a bottle. A bottle full of water. When you want to pour out the water, you start with the top, it's poured out, then the middle part is poured out, and then the last bit of water at the end is also poured out. When you want to fill in water into the bottle, you first pour the water in to the bottom, then the middle, and then the last bit. Similarly with the complete breath, when you exhale, you start by breathing out of the upper chest, then the chest, and then finally the diaphragm. And when you breathe in, you breathe in first, fill up the diaphragm area, then the chest, and then finally the upper chest. Once again, do not exceed your capacity. Do this maybe about 10 times, and that should be enough. 10 breaths, it should be enough. It's a good practice again to purify and to let out all the toxins. However, there is one misunderstanding which occurs with a lot of people who practice the complete breath. A lot of people who are doing this, they are trying to establish the complete breath in their daily regular breathing pattern. This is not meant to be your natural breathing pattern. This is a practice, a technique that you do for 10 breaths and that's all. You don't need to do more than that. If you do this all the time, you form the habit of doing this all the time, you are sending a signal to the nervous system and to the brain. I am under chronic stress. Who does this? The person who is running for his life from the from a tiger or from a I don't know um, I don't know a, a very dangerous situation is under such stress. He's using all the three and over a period of time. Imagine to be in that kind of frame of mind all the time. That, that, that seems to be like hell and that's what you end up doing. If you would end up doing this all the time. 
So very important because I've had a number of people who have come to me having read websites <laughs> somewhere or the other in the internet and then believing that this is how one should breathe all the time. So it's important that you don't do this all the time. Okay, any questions to, to this? All right. So we can move on to the next one. That's Kapalbhati. Just a short word here. Kapalbhati is actually a Shatkriya. Uh, these are cleansing practices. And in our tradition, as I mentioned, that these breathing practices are not really pranayam. These are cleansing practices. These are practices to help you relax and remove and release toxins. And they help you prepare for actual pranayama. And the actual pranayama is done at a mental level. So, for those of you who might be wondering, well, why, am, why is Kapalbhati mentioned here? It is, yes, it is a cleansing practice. It is a Shatkriya. And it's very easy to practice. Rapid exhalations, that's all that there is to it. But we will have a look at it here on the website. Add it somewhere here. Yep. So for Kapal Bhati, we use the diaphragm and abdominal muscles and quick forceful exhalations. So you expel the breath in a very explosive way. This is followed by a spontaneous inhalation. So when you expel the breath out, the inhalation is spontaneous. You don't have to do anything. So you must understand that one is one aspect is voluntary, the other is involuntary in this practice. And if you do this ten times in rapid succession, you have one round. And we do always ten, uh, sorry, we do always three rounds. We can begin with 10. Everybody can begin with 10. And while doing it, you should make sure you do not strain yourself. Do not do more than your capacity. You might, you might experience sort of pain, you know, and discomfort or even dizziness if you do too much of this. Rest between the rounds and allow the respiration to return to normal. And the period of rest between the rounds as always, varies depending on how much you're doing. While doing Kapal Bhati, let your attention be at the abdominal muscles. A great deal of carbon dioxide is eliminated as a result of this practice, so extremely good practice for release of toxins from the body, purification of the body, of the pranic vehicles, of the nadis. So once again, we have a, a table here, um, just a suggestion. And you could start with the first four weeks doing 10 expulsions. And uh, Scott very shortly showed himself. <laughs> uh, Sorry, didn't mean to do that. No, that's okay. That happens. I know I'm also doing things sometimes here. Okay, so you can then um, increase it for next month 
to 20 rounds. And as you come to the higher numbers, higher expulsions per round, you know, you need to be sure that you're not pushing yourself. So in week 9, 10, you can do 30, week 11, 12, 40, keep adding 10s until week 27 to 28 around that time you will have around 120 expulsions per round that may sound like a lot and it is a lot ideally you should not go beyond this number because then your ex exhalations inhalations will become very shallow so 120 is a good number if you go beyond that, it will become very superficial and, and it doesn't quite, you know, the benefit decreases rather than increasing. So 120 is kind of the optimum number of expulsions per round. Don't strain your system. Take the breaks between rounds and as you go down this table, as you increase the number of expulsions, you will find that you need to spend a longer time taking the breaks in between until your breath has returned back to normal. So these pauses here between the three rounds are very important. <clears throat> so, uh, if you find that you are straining yourself, go back to the lower number of expulsions or spend just two more, two more weeks on one of these things. If you are at 80 expulsions per round and you find it's simply too hard on your system, then go back to 70 or even 60 and stay there for a little longer. You know, Stay at 60 for, for four weeks instead of two weeks. So you need to adjust there to find the right number for yourself. So it's approximately about a seven month program here. Any questions so far on that? Linda, you wanted to say something? Okay. So that was Kapalvati. If there are no more questions to Kapalvati, we can move on to Pastrika. I had a more general question on the placement of the whole uh, breathing exercises mm -hmm. in the sequence of doing your practice, because I've seen some people, they actually start with these breathing practices and then do asanas. Mm -hmm. You just explain that a little bit, especially yeah. they seen people starting with Kapalabhati, uh, you know, they just forcefully go into this and um, just wanted to understand that a little bit better. That happens sometimes because a lot of people are practicing Kapal Bhati as a Shatkriya and many schools in India teach that as a part of a kind of a cleansing routine. But the thing is that the way we are doing it here, with these kind of numbers, you can't do it in the beginning. You need to prepare your system for it. So with these kind of numbers, you know, if you're do doing 10, that's okay. Then it doesn't matter really. It's a very small number. And so those people who are doing Kapal Bhati as part of a cleansing routine, maybe in the morning with, with Jal Neti or, you know, tongue cleaning and, and things like that, to do uh, after Jal Neti uh, 10 expulsions is totally fine. But here... It is part of a series uh, as a preparation for deeper meditation and uh, advanced pranayama. 
leading to higher levels of consciousness. This cannot be done right in the beginning. For this, you have to prepare yourself right in the beginning with doing some sort of internal dialogue, doing jo joints and glands, loosening, some loosening exercises, a couple of asanas, then coming to breathing practices, one of which could be Kapalabhati. Then moving on to meditation practices. Now, for this, of course, it's advisable to have the guidance of a teacher who is uh, experienced in the entire process of meditation. To do randomly practices in between um, without any proper system does not seem to have much... Uh, you know, it does not seem to be of much use. You do need a systematic approach if you want to have results. If you want to really progress, you need to have a systematic approach. Yeah. Okay. So we can do Bastrika. It's uh, not very long. So, definitely we can do that. And so we have, Vastrika is the bellows, named after the bellows, for those of you who don't know for sure what the bellows are. So when you light a fire, you need to fan the fire, you know, you give it oxygen. So the fire gets hotter, bigger, it burns really hard. So... Linda, I'm going to have to mute you because there is some <clears throat> disturbance from your end. You can use the chat if you want to say anything. So the bellows are the, a practice to churn up energy in the body. It's an excellent preparation for, for practices for those who want to attain higher levels of consciousness. You can sit in your chosen posture. You inhale slowly till the abdomen is expanded and exhale forcefully through the nostrils and then followed by rapid inhalation as well. In Kapal Bhati, you only had exhalation. The inhalation was involuntary. Here, both are voluntary. Inhalation as well as exhalation. You begin slowly and then you pick up speed like a train. So you begin slowly with And then get faster. You know, chugging like a train. One exhalation and one inhalation together make one cycle. You begin with ten cycles, that makes one round. You go through the same procedure as always. We have a table and we have about seven months that we can take to expand our capacity, beginning with those 10 cycles per round, always doing three rounds, taking little breaks between. After about three weeks, you can move on to 20 cycles per round, then 30, rapidly increase every week by 10, so 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, keep going until you reach around 240. Seems like a very high number, and it is. Therefore, do not exceed your capacity. It turns up large amounts of energy. Not everybody can integrate these high amounts of energy. So if you find yourself just kind of reeling under the impact of these, this practice, then you can just stop somewhere, maybe at 120, and stay there for a couple of months. It's totally fine. 
okay? It's a very powerful practice. If you're not sure, you have doubts, don't do it. If you um, find yourself feeling uncomfortable, you can go backwards actually and, and stay somewhere where you're comfortable, like maybe 50 or even 30. These are relatively easy. And if you don't have any physical problems, if you don't have any respiratory problems, then this is fine. Do not do any of these practices when you are suffering from acute respiratory problems, coughs, colds, or even things like asthma, bronchitis, etc. Do not do these without guidance if you have any acute um, problem and even if you have a chronic respiratory problem, such as things like asthma, you know, or bronchial asthma. Aranka, what do you mean? Can I do these practices together? What, what, does, what do you mean by that? Um, I just mean if I start in the morning with doing my asanas mm -hmm. and then I, I just start to do them after each other. After? Like uh, after each other. Yes, uh, yes. You can do Atma Vichara first, but, then do asanas and then prana, uh, breathing exercises. Yes, I mean, but, but it is quite... If, if we're using the... Um, the t the the tabels no the the, the schedules tables? with it the what with it it is the 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 how do I say this in English I forget it the um, the structure with the weeks and the cycles y around yes, the, the table yeah yeah it is it is quite something to to keep to hold on to isn't it I mean you you. You count it every week, and this this prana of this breathing exercise you do so many times and so many rounds, mm -hmm. and then you really need need to keep track on it to yes. to develop yourself in a certain way. Yes, yes. Um, if you are able to do it without uh, aid, it would mean simply having to be very aware, being very careful. Uh, not exceeding your capacity and increasing the numbers as to your capacity, what you're comfortable with. As I said, the table is a suggestion. It gives an idea how you can increase your capacity over a period of time. Not that you jump from, you know, 10 to 50 and then from 50 to 100, no. you know, that's what people are doing. So the table gives you the idea of how to gradually increase it doesn't mean, that's why I mentioned again, it's a suggestion, it's not a rigid uh, thing to follow. And no. some people find it useful to follow the table, they feel uh, safer. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, it's nice, yeah. I like it's, it. So it, it and maybe work. it's even a good idea to print it out and to have yes. it next to your uh, place where you do your things. Yes, exactly. And as a kind of a hand rule, you can do double the amount of Bhastrika as compared to what you're doing in Kapalbhati. The ratio is double. Okay. So whatever Kapalbhati you're doing, you can do approximately double the amount in Bhastrika. Yeah, okay. So, Thank you. Yeah. Anju, is it necessary to do maximum number of cycles to achieve higher state? Actually not. No, it's not necessary. <laughs> it's only necessary if you're in a hurry. <laughs> So this is for those who are, you know, kind of want to break all speed limits and things like that. And they want to go fast. So if you are um, ambitious in the sense that, um, yeah, you, you want to attain something, a higher state, and you're in a bit of a hurry, then you can, you can do that. What happens is that some people say, oh, seven months, that's a long period of time. Actually, it isn't. It really isn't a long period of time because this is sustainable. Seven months gradual increase is sustainable. What happens very often otherwise is that people end up jumping from 10 to 50 in a week's time or in two weeks' time. Then they collapse. They, 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 they're just not able to sustain it. They, they stop practicing. Then they don't practice for another few weeks. Then they come back and they start maybe at 30 and then after a week, they increase to 100. And then they eventually just stop practicing, you know. So 
the idea of over a period of time expanding your capacity uh, in a sustainable way you will find that it is actually not very ambitious it is it is quite gentle if you follow that and if you are dedicated and disciplined it doesn't mean that you have to do 240 but you can also do 100 that's also okay Right. And then, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, actually, uh, like we are doing, and we are sustaining the cycle for 110. Mm-hmm. We are maintaining the week for 15, and you know. So, does it mean that we we should uh, carry on forward for the cycle if you are comfortable? So that's what you're trying to mean. That you carry on for over a period of time. You mean? Yeah. 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 Uh, like completing the 28th and 240. If we are comfortable, you know, uh, according to a bo- body system, like 170 or 180 max at yes. max. Yes, yes, so yes, yes. So do we need to carry on? No, 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 no. You don't have to. You, uh, <laughs> As I said, you don't have to be at 240. Yeah. It's, it's, okay. It would be um, on the higher side. Very few people do that. Let me put it this way. Uh, 240 would be somebody who wants to attain moksha in this lifetime. Uh-huh. Okay? But it doesn't and, mean yeah. that, that you have to do it. If you feel that your body is not able to take more than that and you feel comfortable at 180, but if you sustain it, it's probably going to have the same impact as doing 240 once in a while. It's then better to do 180 sust- over a sustainable period of time. You know, we say Uh do practice without break or long period of time. It says in the Yoga Sutra, long period of time. Uh What does long period of time mean? Long period of time means until you attain moksha. So you should be able to sustain. Better to do less but sustainable than to be ambitious and then, you know, keep falling back, keep falling back and being irregular. So, and one more question. Yes. Uh, like most of the people, like they're comfortable with doing the pranayam at the first stage, what you told us. And many people, because of their medical condition, they're not able to perform this kapalbhati and astrika. So, is it okay? What do you mean at the first stage? You mean like a shat kriya? First, the first stage. stage uh, no, no. I mean uh, the breath, uh, exhalation and inhalation. The ratio, I mean. Hmm. And uh, because in all, because as you said that these two will help uh, out further. So sometimes people are not able to perform this bhastrika because of some medical conditions and as well as the kapalbhati also. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, of course. If they have a medical condition... Yeah. That's that's why I mentioned if you have respiratory problems, whether acute or chronic, then you can do 10 cycles in a very gentle way. If they can do that, that's fine. They just should not exert or should not exceed their capacity in any way. I have had people with respiratory problems, uh, even chronic, who are able to do gentle 20 or 30, but not when you have an acute issue. Acute, it is always best not to do any breathing exercises except for equal breathing and um, a very low count of uh, two to one breathing. But the others should be stopped under, uh, you know, acute, in acute situations. So we are over time and I think we can stop here. It was nice having everybody, and we... Very nice, thank you. We will meet up next time, Friday for Bhagavad Gita, and uh, Sunday for Pranayam. We continue Pranayam, we continue now to the more advanced parts and one of the finest practices for this is going to be... Um, coming up soon, Nadi Shodhana, we still have Ujjayi and Brahmari to go through and then we do Nadi Shodhana. So we are now getting to the more exciting part. All right, have a nice um, Sunday 
or whatever is left of it. And uh, see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.